Professor Colin Tatz is our keynote speaker today. Professor Colin Tatz was born in South Africa, arriving in Australia in 1960 in order to study governmental management of Aboriginal affairs. His list of publications are far too numerous to elaborate here, covering such diverse topics as the history of the Monash Country Club, Australian Aboriginal athletes, the Jewish Holocaust, Aboriginal and Australian genocide, suicide and other health issues amongst Indigenous populations in Australia, New Zealand and Canada, and denial of genocide. Professor Tatz has dedicated his illustrious career to the understanding and teaching of hatred and genocide, developing genocide studies courses at a number of Australian universities, including the University of Technology, Sydney. In 1998, under Professor Tatz's leadership and with the sponsorship of the Pontian Greek Associations in Sydney, the Centre for Comparative Genocide Studies at Macquarie University became the world's first to incorporate research and teaching of the Greek genocide into its programs. The Genocide Studies programs initiated by Professor Tatz educate hundreds of secondary and tertiary students each year about the Greek, Armenian and Assyrian genocides. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our great honour to present tonight's keynote speaker, a true friend of Hellenism, Professor Colin Tatz. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, what are we here for? We're here to commemorate a particular event. Last month, there was a commemoration in Sydney and right across the country, and in fact, worldwide, of the Jewish Holocaust. There were commemoration ceremonies in this room and at the Willoughby Town Hall for the Armenian Genocide. And now, not least, not last, by any means, the commemoration of what happened to the Assyrians, to the Pontian Greek, as well as the Armenians. What we need to look at is the victim. The victims were victims because of who they were. They were chosen because they were Jews or because they were Armenians or because they were Greek or because they were Assyrian Christians. They weren't just victimized because they were a particular group that happened to be in the way of whatever the particular problem was. The Genocide Convention insists that genocide has to be a systematic attack on a particular group because they are that group. The people we are commemorating tonight were members of that group. We have a problem in a number of communities, and I just want to raise this in passing very briefly. When Hitler attacked Jews, he wanted to systematically annihilate a particular group of people as a favor to the world. He didn't say Orthodox Jews. He didn't say progressive or reformed Jews. He didn't say secular Jews or agnostic Jews or apostate Jews who'd given up their faith. He didn't say Zionists or anti-Zionists. He said Jews. Now, in life, we are accustomed, as I'm a member of that Jewish group, to infighting, to fractions, to bitternesses, to hostilities. The tragedy for all of us who belong to an ethnic minority is that the only time there is unity is unity in death. And I always say to Jewish audiences, when it comes to Yom HaShoah, the commemoration day in April, usually, the perpetrators didn't single out particular groups of Jews for destruction. They picked on all Jews. The Turks didn't single out Pontians just simply because they lived in the area known as Pontus, but it was because they were Greeks. And they picked on Assyrians because they were Assyrian Christians. And they picked on Armenians because they were Armenians. So please, I hope that in this talk, and in talks to come, we will kind of give up the notion that seems to be not prevalent, but it crops up from time to time, that a particular commemoration belongs to one geographic group and doesn't belong to the totality of that group. 
Okay, what is genocide? We have a problem with genocide because the popular conception of genocide that most of us have grown up with, and certainly the younger generation have grown up with, is people in striped pajamas hanging off the wire at a place called Auschwitz. It is also a graphic depiction of what happened in 100 days in Kigali in Rwanda. It is pictures, stark pictures, reminiscent of the Holocaust that we see in the depiction of what happened in Kosovo and in Bosnia. So what we're left with is a popular image, which is a wrong image, that genocide is merely or simply or only the killing of people. And if it didn't involve killing, then it must be something else. But the Genocide Convention, which was worked at long and hard by a number of delegates, including the man, he wasn't a delegate, but he was the, the founder of the word genocide, Rafael Lemkin, who was a Polish jurist, lawyer, listed five separate acts that constitute the crime of genocide. And the first one is the obvious one, killing members of a particular group because they are members of that group. Secondly, causing serious bodily and mental harm to a group, but it doesn't specify the nature of the physical and mental harm, but you can guess what it means. Thirdly, bringing about conditions of life that are likely to destroy that, those people, slave labor camps, deportations, ethnic cleansing, and so on. Fourthly, sterilization of children or people in a group so that they can't reproduce themselves. And finally, the forcible removal of children from one group to another. And hereby hangs a problem. Because when people like myself write about the Aboriginal genocide and talk about the systematic removal of children, people say that can't be genocide because it doesn't look like Auschwitz. And it doesn't look like Kigali. And it doesn't look like Sarajevo. But it is genocide. And while people rail against the co-equation of those five acts, saying the one is killing, but the other, the children are still alive. They may have been removed, but they're still alive. Nevertheless, removing children in that way, and this happened very clearly in the Turkish case, is an act of genocide. Now, for years teaching genocide studies courses at Macquarie and elsewhere, I used to talk to my students and sort of muttered under my breath that we need some kind of a Richter scale we need some kind of a measuring rod which will distinguish the various cases of genocide. And a Richter scale, as you know, is Charles Richter, a seismologist who discovers a way of measuring the magnitude of earthquakes. I'm not suggesting for a moment that we have the equivalent of a 10 logarithm number to measure the scale of genocide, but we need something. We need something that will help us encompass what happened in Australia over a period of 124 years, the physical killing and the removal of children, and what happened in Rwanda in 100 days. Can you equate, can you encompass those two things? Yes, you can, and you have to do it by devising a scale, which I just for convenience called a Richter scale, and I'm very happy to report that after the Armenian commemoration events last month, the visiting guest speaker, Henry Tyriel from Worcester State University in Boston, has agreed to join me in writing a major paper, I hope it'll be a major paper, on the need for a Richter scale. And I share just a few thoughts with you about this. We need to approach it in six categories. The first category is the precursors, the prerequisites, the precedents, what went before the actual events. What is the history of violence and antagonism towards a group? The second category is the actual genocide events themselves. The third category is to look at the immediate post-genocide analysis, just trying to come to terms with what it was that actually happened. Fourthly, we need to look at the aftermath and the aftermath includes things like trials, prosecutions, uh, trying to find out who is accountable, who is responsible. We then need to look at things like the legacies. 
And the legacies are terribly important because we tend to forget the legacies. We're here tonight to commemorate a legacy. The legacy, as Henry Tyriald explained in this room less than a month ago, is that the genocidal events may have occurred 95 years ago. They may have occurred 65 years ago. The legacy is alive here in this room right now. The legacy does not go away. People are killed in the killing fields or people are attacked systematically in various regions. But the legacies go down to the second, third, fourth, fifth, and down to the generations. As my friend Henry Terriel said, we not only have to consider the living when we talk about legacies, we have to consider those who are unborn. That may sound a little bit odd, but think of the legions of people who were not born. Think of the legions of people who not only were not born, but in turn did not give birth to the next generation of people. The legacy is also a terrible one. A terrible one, as Henry pointed out, of a power imbalance. And the power imbalance is that a minority of people, Assyrians, Armenians, Pontian Greeks, suffered at the hands of a powerful perpetrator. And you still do. The power imbalance that occurred physically in the killing fields is still there today. Turkey says we didn't do it. Turkey is big and powerful. Pontian Greek minorities are a minority. Armenians are a minority, both in Armenia and in their diaspora. The Assyrians an even smaller minority. In the power table, sitting around at a conference, as Henry has suggested, that we need to perhaps rethink the whole notion of the aftermath in terms of reparations and seeking three things. Either giving back the givable, or B, restoring the restorable, such as churches, or C, in the event that you can't give back and that you can't restore, then you need to make financial compensation. We haven't yet got to the stage of talking about those ideas, but even if we do get to that stage of talking about them, how do you sit at a table with a powerful Republic of Turkey while you are in the minority status that you're in? This is a problem, and this is a legacy. The other thing we have to look at is the outcomes. What has this genocide done to the psyche, to the souls of the people who were victims? The living victims, the living survivors, the living generations. There is a deep, deep scar which doesn't go away. One of the problems associated with that scar is that minority communities begin to define themselves only as victims of a genocide. They have a long, long history that goes back to antiquity. What happened to that history? What happened to the Greek traditions from my friends Plato and Aristotle, whom I studied so carefully when I was a university student? What happens to the legacy of the Hellenic Empire and the Hellenic civilization? Is all this suddenly torn asunder because there was a catastrophic event between 1913 and 1924? My friend Conrad Quitt, a noted Holocaust historian, always laments, and rightly so, that a lot of Jewish communities have come to define themselves in terms of their victimness and their victimhood as a result of the Holocaust. What happened to 5,000 years of Jewish civilization? What's happened to that? And here we have to really seriously think not about diminishing or putting aside the genocide, but taking stock about the other attributes, the other achievements, the other brilliance of those civilizations that are still a legacy for the world. I'm very pleased to say that my friend Henry Tyriold has agreed with me. We will do a lot of research and we will do a lot of work in trying to 
bring together a scale, a template, by which we can adjudicate, make some kind of judgments about cases that appear to be so different in scale, in method, in purpose, in outcomes, in aftermath. Now, we know that 350,000 Pontian Greeks, 250,000 Assyrians, and 1.5 million Armenians were killed by the Turks. And it is now fortunate that we are seeing the beginnings of a Turkish revolt, very small but very important and very powerful, of young Turkish scholars beginning to address the whole issue and questioning the whole history of their state. And if truth is going to emerge, it is more likely to happen through the activities of, I don't want to use that word, I won't say young Turks because they were the bad guys, youngish Turks who will take up the cudgels rather than trying to get Turkey to bow to external pressure. And a new book came onto the market this month Tana Aksam, who's a brilliant Turkish student now living in the United States, has just published a book, The Young Turks' Crime Against Humanity, the Armenian Genocide and Ethnic Cleansing in the Ottoman Empire. I haven't read the book yet. I've only read little snippets of it because it's only just appeared in the last two or three weeks. But when people like Aksam begin to write cosmic, huge canvas histories, of what happened at the hands of the Turks, we're beginning to see the beginning of something very significant. But I've come here tonight essentially to talk to you about denialism. And the question is, what is denialism? It sounds simple. But just as there is a Richter scale needed to look at the levels and degrees and gradations of genocide, so we need a kind of Richter scale with which to look at denialism because denialism is in different grades as well. There's a man called Stanley Cohen, who's an English sociologist, British sociologist, who wrote a book some years ago called The State of Denial. And his definition of denialism is, he calls it the politics of ethnic amnesia. Lovely phrase. And there's a lot of politics about ethnic amnesia. Nowhere better illustrated than in some of the comments we've already heard this evening. But let's look very briefly at the scales that are involved in denialism. The first, not necessarily in this order, is relativizing. That is, your genocide is not as bad as my genocide, which wasn't as bad as his genocide, etc. So you relativize, you make it relative. Bigger, smaller, smallest, largest, first, second, third, and so on and so forth. The second one is ghastly, trivializing the Holocaust or genocide. It was only, says some, say some Holocaust denied, only three million Jews. Not six million, only three million. Or only 250,000 criminals who were put to death, justifiably so, say the denialists. That word only is a very mischievous word. It trivializes everything. The third one is a form of what I call flattening. What does flattening mean? Well, okay, everybody does it, so why are you picking on me, Turkey? Everybody commits genocide, so what's so special about the Turkish one? So you don't now have peaks of denialism. You don't have peaks of genocide. If everybody does it, then there is a universality about this activity which makes it normal. Deflecting. Yes, what is deflecting? Turks are very good at deflecting. You lost 1.5 million Armenians and you lost 350,000 Pontian Greeks, but we lost more. The casualties amongst the Turks were greater than the number of victims 
of the so-called genocide. So why are you making out a case? Because we are the ones who should be pleading for apologies and so on. There is another form of denialism. It's called appropriating. Appropriating in law means stealing. You steal somebody else's history. So what becomes the Christian minority victimhood at the hands of Turkey in the Near East becomes Turkish history. And it's very easy to, the only people who don't do this, I must say, are the Germans. There is distorting as another form of denialism. What is distorting? Distorting is, well, you've got to look at the context. And we've already heard uh, from the South Australian Senator Ferguson, <sighs> bad things happen. There was a civil war. War is terrible. War is horrible. People die in war. We lost X million Turks, you lost Y million uh, uh, Christians. So, okay, let's, let's level the playing field. There is another one. In law, it's called Tukok. Tukok, T-U-Q-U-O-Q-U-E, means you also did it. So why are you picking on me? You did it. So, okay, we both did it together, or all three of us did it together, or 20 of us did it together, and that kind of normalizes the situation. There is forgetting. Now to forget, especially at my age, is very easy. I don't know where my car, key, car keys are, uh, and I don't know where various documents are, and one forgets. It's uh, just one of those inevitable things that occurs as a loss of memory with the aging process. Okay. But to forget in the sense of not knowing where your car keys are, is not the same as forgetting in this denialist context. There's a man called David Dizenhaus, who's a very esteemed professor of jurisprudence and the philosophy of law, Toronto University, he's a South African, who went to Toronto some years ago. And in the 1990s, he went back to South Africa as a lawyer to look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings to see what was happening to the concept of justice after the end of so-called end of apartheid. And he has an unforgettable line in this. I'll see if I can find it. He says, forgetting is a social and political action. In these national contexts, it requires a deliberate decision from those from the vantage of one who in fact remembers. So that forgetting in this Turkish sense is a conscious and deliberate act of forgetting by people who in fact remember only too well what it is that happened because it's been documented from A to Z. There is another form, outright denial. It never happened, just it never happened. The Turks have at least moved a little bit from outright denial to the various other shades that I've already mentioned, to relativizing, to trivializing, to flattening, and so on. There are very few Turks today who say nothing happened. How can they ever have thought they could get away with saying that nothing happened? We've already had a reference from Mr. Clark that there were German and Austrian missionaries, especially a man called Dr. Lepsius, who was a German missionary, who gave first-hand accounts. Remember that people could send telegrams even in those days, and they sent the telegrams. They sent the telegrams to newspapers as far as Maitland. We've had some of the things on the screen here, the Gisborne Times or the uh, Gippsland Times or whatever it is. These were messages that were broadcast around the world at the particular time. We have that still very readable and incredible book by Henry Morgenthau, who was the American ambassador to Turkey in those fateful years beginning in 1913. He left in 1916, end of, end of 1916, saying he could stand it no longer. He had daily consultations 
with Enver Pasha, Kemal Pasha, Talat Pasha, the triumvirate who basically put the genocide into operation. They came to his offices. He went to their homes. And he gives a more personal account than can ever be achieved by anybody in the book called The Ambassador's Story, which you should read if you haven't read it. Ninthly, we have the intention of hurting. There's a famous French classical scholar called Pierre Vidal Naquet, who wrote a book with a very powerful title. It's called The Assassins of Memory. And it's a marvelously apt title for denialists, The Assassins of Memory. And he says, denialists are intent on striking a community in the thousand painful fibers that continue to link it to its own past. A thousand painful fibers. I think the answer is a million painful fibers. That if you really dislike, hate, have an antipathy, an abhorrence for the victims, what you do is not only do you kill them in the killing fields, but then you kill them in the history books by saying it didn't happen to them, or they invented it. And finally, there is the need by perpetrators, again with the exception of modern Germany, to sustain the power imbalance that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Now, what about free speech? A year ago, a journalist for whom I have no time, no respect and no regard by the name of Andrew Bolt writes in one of the Melbourne newspapers about a group of eight named Aborigines whom he says are light-skinned, apparent Aborigines who are milking the funding system for all they can get out of it. And something has got to be done to expose this blackmail by people who are not really Aborigines. A woman called Pat Etock, who was once a student of mine at Macquarie, is now crippled, I think, in a wheelchair, rightly takes umbrage and she goes to court and she protests that this is contrary to the Racial Discrimination Act. It goes before Justice Bromberg in September 2011. And the judge rules that both two articles breached the Racial Discrimination Act because his attack was, quote, calculated to offend, quote, inflamed negative views, quote, omitted crucial information and was full of errors. Whereupon Andrew Bolt shrieked, as did some of his colleagues, that this was the beginning of the erosion of free speech in Australia. The Shadow Attorney General, George Brandis, claimed that a Liberal coalition government, when it comes to power, would repeal Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act because there's no room in our society for a law which prohibits vilification and incitement to racial hatred. Rhetoric, did he mean it? Would he say it again if he had a second chance? I don't know. But it's very, very interesting that not only a man who is seemingly adored by a certain section of the population, he seems to be on a hell of a lot of television lately, and a man of Brandis's standing should say there is no room for an anti-vilification law or a race hatred law in this country in the name of free speech. Now, where does all this come from? It comes from what the Americans call First Amendment jurisprudence. The American Constitution, which is a very fine document in many ways, has a Bill of Rights contained in it. 
And the Bill of Rights says, and I'll read from this, the First Amendment to the American Constitution, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. So the key clause, there shall be no abridgment of the freedom of speech or of the press. And there are legions of court cases in the United States based on First Amendment jurisprudence. It's very important stuff, except this is Australia and not America, and we don't have such a clause in our Constitution. What is free speech? It is a phrase trumpeted again and again and again, and particularly in university circles where I'm very familiar with cries of interference with academic freedom and so on and so forth. There was a man in our midst some years ago, died, a man of possibly flawed character, or probably of flawed character, who became a high court judge, but a very good one, his name was Lionel Murphy. And he left some outstanding judgments in his wake for all the lawyers to read in law school and elsewhere. And he made a remarkable statement in one of his judgments. Listen carefully. Free speech is only what is left after due weight has been accorded to the laws relating to defamation, to blasphemy, to copyright, to sedition, to obscenity, the use of insulting words, official secrets, contempt of court and parliament, incitement and censorship. That's what's left over, is free speech. One of the things you learn in law school, which I once attended in first year, the very first lecture in criminal law, you're not allowed to shout, shout the word fire in a crowded theater. Why? It's free speech. I want to cry fire in this parliamentary theater. I'm not allowed to do so because it'll cause stampede and panic and possible injury and possible death. There are no such things as absolute rights. And Andrew Bolt needs a lesson in elementary civics to know that there is no absolute right, neither here nor in the American Constitution or in the land of America, where you can reside where you want to reside, where you can say what you want to say, and you can practice whatever religion you want to practice, including, say, killing of infants, infanticide, maybe part of a religion, or polygamy. So there are always limits to free speech. And what is involved here tonight on this commemoration is can we, should we, outlaw denialism? Okay. Eighteen countries around the world have made it a criminal offense to deny the Holocaust. I'll read you the list. It's an interesting list. Austria, Belgium, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Czech Republic, France, I'm not talking about the recent problem with the French law about outlawing denial, and this is denying the Holocaust. France, Germany, as you would expect, Hungary, Israel, Liechtenstein, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Slovakia, Spain, and Switzerland. The point about these laws in those countries is that much contrary to the views of a respected friend of mine, and he is a friend of mine, but we differ violently on this issue, Philip Adams, who says you can't put people in jail for mere words. I think you can. Mere words have killed a great many people in the name of genocide. The walls of democracy have not crumbled in those 18 countries because they have a law outlawing Holocaust denial. Why can't we have a law that outlaws denial of these other genocides that we're talking about? The question 
that resides in law to be determined is which is the greater social harm. The harm to this doctrine of free speech, which as I said is not an absolute right at all, or the social, personal, psychic harm that denialism of a genocide produces. What is the Turkish problem? Why is there such an incredible level of denialism by the Republic of Turkey, where the whole apparatus of the state, and believe me, it is the whole apparatus of the state, we've already heard about uh, Mr. Shoebridge's problem with emails, we've heard Mr. Atkinson's problem with a senator and a whole parliamentary hot topic, etc. This level of Turkish paranoia is the only word for it. The levels to which the Turkish government will go is almost unbelievable. We could stand here all night and regale you with stories of how the Turkish government, quite contrary to the laws of diplomacy, have seriously and systematically engaged in interference in Australia's domestic affairs Panyoti Diamatis put on a conference at Macquarie in 1998 on the whole question of the fate of Christian minorities in the Near East. What happens is that a Turk invites himself to the conference. He wants to make a major denial speech, but the Turkish Consul General arrives, eventually arrives with a band of thugs. They try to disrupt the meeting, and so it goes on and on and on. I don't have to go into all of this. Why the denial? There's several reasons. First of all, I think the young Turks who overthrew Sultan Hamid II in 1908 put forward the proposition to the world that they were establishing democracy, that the young Turkish movement would be beacons of democracy in that part of the Middle East or the Near East. If you set yourself up as a foundation stone of democracy in a region, a democracy can hardly turn around and say, we committed these atrocities because democracies don't commit those atrocities. Not true, actually, because one of the subjects that needs serious study, and it has become a subject of study recently, is how much genocide has occurred in democratic states and by democratic states, including the United States and including this state. The Turks also have an ethos, a history, a belief system of honor that there will be no blood on the national escutcheon, on the national shield. And therefore, any suggestion that they have a blot on their history has to be eliminated. Thirdly, I think there is a very real fear of reparations and reparations of the kind I've already suggested or Tyrrell has suggested of restoring, giving back, or paying financial compensation. There have been one or two cases recently, particularly New York Life Assurance Company with a private settlement and so on and so forth with a group of survivors who claimed their rightful inheritances and payments and so on and so forth, but that's not the same as uh, an official state of reparations. It's also interesting, just by the way, and in passing, that on National Sorry Day here in Australia, on February the 13th, 2008, when that very dramatic television presentation of a national apology occurred, there was a little rider attached to it at the end of the apology, there will be no reparations. Now, what kind of an apology is it when you apologize to the victims for what you've done, but say you're not worthy enough as victims to be given any compensation or reparations. And the ironic thing is that two of the worst offending states in Australian history, in terms of physical killing of Aborigines, Western Australia, set up a two-year reparation scheme, but if you didn't apply within the two years, you couldn't apply anymore. But the one state, would you believe, that has paid reparations to Aborigines is Tasmania. 
where some families got, or some individuals got $55,000 each, a lot of them got $4,000 each, but okay, it's a very small price to pay for those activities. The fourth reason I want to give about Turkish denialism is that it's a state in transition. Turkey doesn't know at this stage whether it's going to be a secular state or remain a secular state or whether it's going to become a fully Islamicized state with Sharia law and so on. When a state is in transition, it cannot afford to engage in activities like thinking about the past or making restitution or atonement for the past. And fifthly, and this is a little bit disconcerting, I think that the Turkish denial apparatus is so vast, so embedded, so imbued in their bureaucracies, in their state departments, in their schools, in their hospitals, in their clinics, wherever you may go, that it's a juggernaut that it couldn't stop even if it wanted to. And that's, that is a very frightening prospect. It's only a thought, it's only a supposition on my part, but if tomorrow the Turkish government said, we stop with the denial, the machinery that they have set in motion has a momentum of its own and it will continue. And finally, I come to the question of what we as an audience, we as a community, we as a group of victims in a sense, what can we do? You can firstly engage in lobbying lobbying parliamentarians, lobbying the press, lobbying councillors, lobbying anybody who will listen to your case and eventually somebody will listen. You need to engage in another democratic process called pressure group politics, voting. A lot of politicians, with, with due respect to those who are in the room, believe that there are such things as the Jewish vote the Greek vote, the Armenian vote. It's a myth. They may be important in one or two boroughs or one or two districts of a particular electorate, but they're not going to sway the whole national parliament or the whole state parliament. But politicians believe that they have to pay court to the views and the needs and the wants and the desires and the grievances of minority communities. Well, work on it, bank on it, do it. You can target the social media. You can target the events, not of Anzac Day, that would be seen rightly as some form of desecration of a day that is celebrated so greatly in Australia. But you can, as I suggested in my Richter scale, bring to the attention of the Australian public the events that not only led up to Anzac Day, but what it was, as Pagnotti has done so elegantly with Victor Vic, Vic and Bob Kenyon, shown just how much Australian prisoners of war knew and saw of the events that we're talking about tonight. Leaving records, leaving memoirs, writing letters, sending postcards, taking pictures, writing memoirs and personal accounts of what went on in front of their very eyes because the Australian prisoners of war were not put in jails or in dungeons. They were left in villages from which there was no way to get in or way, way to get out. So they were left running around in these little villages and they happened to have cameras and they happened to have pen and pencil. There is the obvious route of education and education in its very broadest sense. You can also engage in what I call the demolition, on various speakers this evening talked about, the demolition of myths. How do you demolish a myth? Especially a myth that is as grand as the Anzac tradition, that the, na the nation was born in the crucible of Gallipoli, that all the years that happened from 1788 to 1917 didn't occur, but suddenly we get born a sort of special 
virgin birth that occurs in 1917 when we suddenly become a nation. I don't know what the hell we were supposed to be before 1917, but the notion is that 1917 we were born. It's a myth. Can you demolish myths? Well, it's interesting. I'm reading a book by Anthony Summers, who's a noted writer and journalist, on the life of J. Edgar Hoover. And there was a recent Clint Eastwood film, which I hear was not terribly good and I didn't want to see, but I'm interested in Hoover. The most powerful Amer man in American history in the 20th century, the most powerful man for 50 years in America, turns out to be the worst public servant America has ever had. A crook, a liar, a cheat, a forger, a manipulator, a crucifier of innocent victims in his alleged 200,000 communists in, Aust in, in the United States over all those years of un-American activities, four were found guilty of anything. The myth of Hoover has been demolished in my lifetime. I grew up with all those comic books and the FBI and J. Edgar and I wanted an Edgar Hoover shield and all the rest of it. We were all older, the older ones of us were brought up on that kind of nonsense. Myths can be demolished. You can also do what Varant Megadichian so acutely said at the Armenian commemoration last month, and that is talk to politicians. Varant, from memory, talked about at least 20 members of various parliaments who've come on board who are making speeches, who are talking, who are supporting, who are arguing. Joe Hockey did it at the Willoughby Town Hall last month, pledging himself for as long as he breathed to try to bring the federal parliament to a recognition of these events. Politicians are the people who can make these resolutions, but we can help them and we can push them to make those resolutions. And finally, in conclusion, I want you to please take on board one message from me. That if you engage in lobbying, if you engage in social and political pressure, if you engage in disturbing Anzac traditions and memories and myths, don't for one single moment fall for the nonsense that by doing so, somehow you are un-Australian. Thank you.